said someone sent this to me recently and I thought oh this is good he says your identity is who the government says you are your license your passport sin number your personality is who the people that think they know you say you are your reputation is who the people who don't know you say you are your social media presence is who you think you are your browser history is who you are I like that. <laughs> Who you are when no one's looking speaks the most truth about you. Have you heard that or a variation of that? There's some truth to that. There's a lot of truth to that. Who you are when you're alone matters. And Jesus talks about this quite a bit, actually. I want to look at one passage where Jesus discusses this in Matthew chapter 6. And I want to read from the Gen Z Bible again, if, if you will permit me. Is that okay? I, I'm just, I'm really enjoying this. It's just a lot of fun. For those, two weeks ago, I read a passage from the Gen Z Bible, and I'll just give the same clause in case you weren't here. It, it's, it's a Bible written in the vernacular of our younger people. And I just, I, I just find it so refreshing. As I said before, it's not a replacement for your real Bible, but it's a great commentary. And you know what? If it just makes you, piques your curiosity and makes you want to read the Bible, go and buy one. Matthew chapter 6 in the Gen Z Bible. It starts with Jesus saying, aim high like heavenly father high. And then moving on to giving, Jesus is all, don't flex your good deeds for the gram. If you're helping someone out, don't blast it with a trumpet like those clout chasers in synagogues or on Main Street looking for likes. For real, they're getting exactly what they're after, empty likes. But when you help out, keep it on the down low. No need for the left hand to catch what the right hand is throwing. Do it so low key that even you forget about it. And your father, who's all about that incognito life, will hit you back with the real rewards. In a nutshell, Jesus is teaching us the art of genuine love and kindness, not for the views or the likes, but because it's the right playlist for life, <laughs> where the secret to being cool is being kind, especially when no one's watching. Then Jesus is like, when you hit up the divine DMs, don't be that person who makes a public spectacle of it. You know the type, always praying in full view to snag likes and followers. Yeah, they get their reward, but it's all for show. Instead, when you want to chat with the big guy, find your chill spot. Close the door and keep it just between you two. Your father's got that incognito mode on lock and sees what's up in secret. He'll hook you up for keeping it real. And when you're sending up those prayers, don't spam with words like you're trying to hit a word count. Some folks think they'll be heard for their marathon texts. Nah, your dad's ahead of the game. He knows what you need before you even hit send. Isn't that great? Am I the only one enjoying this? <laughs> oh, man. I'll read it in, in the Bible now, an actual translation of the Bible. Although I thought that was actually pretty good. 
Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of other people to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, attracting attention to themselves so people notice their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward already. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to pray out loud in public to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, into your closet, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen, and then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you fast or do other spiritual disciplines, don't do them to be noticed. Make an effort not to draw attention to yourself, so only God who is unseen knows, and God who sees what is done in secret will reward you. There's a lot there, but there's three themes in those teachings that I want to highlight today. Here are the three themes. Number one, be intentional about alone time. Be intentional about alone time. Number two, focus your motivation and your mode. Focus your motivation and your mode of being. And number three, seek divine rewards, not temporal rewards. So those are the three themes that we're going to look at either all today or today and next week. Intentional alone time. So Jesus is saying when you pray, disconnect from everything and everyone. Go into your closet completely by yourself. Be fully present with God and with yourself. Now he also says, when you pray, don't use a lot of words. In fact, he says, that's how, in in another passage, he says, that's how pagans pray. They use lots of words and flowery language and lots of spiritual and religious language as if they can convince God with their many words to do what they want God to do. Jesus says, don't use a lot of words. In fact, don't even pray in public. Go into your closet and talk to God. And it's not really about words. Just be present with God. That's what prayer is really about. Now, this is, this is a struggle. I remember when I first started ministry as a young pastor. I mean, I had been trained to pray. Oh, I love to pray in public. I mean, I just string, and I was raised Baptist, fundamentalist Baptist. I mean, we knew how to pray for seven, 10, 15 minutes. I remember one time I was, when I was a youth pastor, praying one of my prayers, and I got into prayer mode, and then all of a sudden I heard snoring. One of the youth had actually fallen asleep while I was praying. You ever know a pastor like that? Don't point at anyone, but. We, <laughs> Just pr- using the language, just, oh man, we're trained to do that. And I remember, I remember, I don't know what year it was, but I remember being convicted by God reading these passages and Jesus saying, when you pray, don't, that's pagan prayer. You're not, you're not praying like a Christian, you're praying like a pagan, using all those words and flowery language and theological language. Stop it, Jesus is saying, just knock that off. It actually annoys God. I'm going to be honest with you. It annoys God. Just be real. Be present. I remember one time, and I, I know some of you, don't have to raise your hand, but I know some of you will know what I'm talking about, but I'm in, a, I'm in a prayer group, and there's a circle of us, and we're going around praying. And man, people are praying good prayers, you know? They're getting lots of, hmm, yes, Lord. Amen, Lord. You know what I'm talking about? Is, have you been in a prayer? And, and slowly it's building in it. So I'm, I'm like, okay, man, I'm preparing my prayer. And I'm like, I got to come with something good. Oh, boy, they just said what I wanted to say. Okay, I'm going to come up with something else. Then it's my turn to pray, and I start giving it. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. There's no ums. There's no yes, Lords. There's no amen. So I'm like, I got to ratchet this up, man. I got No? You've never been there? The pressure to do a good prayer? What happens in, in what Jesus is saying, don't do that because we enter into what I call an ego persona mode. Any kind of performer or someone who gets in front of people. Pastors have ego issues. And anyone who's sitting in a group praying, 
our ego gets involved and we're no longer being fully present with God and talking with God. We're, we're actually kind of measuring our prayer by the response of other people and how we think we're impacting other people. Jesus says, there's, here's a good solution to get out of that ego persona mode. Just don't do it. Don't pray like pagans. Don't pray like people who are, or think they, they can use words to manipulate the creator of the universe. God already knows what you need. Just be present. In fact, be wary of praying in public in front of other people. Just go into your closet. Spend time alone being fully present with God. Now there's more going on here than just being present with God. Jesus is saying a spiritual discipline that's essential for life, certainly the way of Jesus, is you need time every day. Regular time where you disconnect and disengage from social engagement in the world and just be fully present not only with God but with yourself. And there's many reasons for this. It's not only important to your prayer life and to your character development, it's necessary for you to discover and manifest your authentic self, who you really are. Now this has become an increasingly difficult spiritual discipline over the past 15 years. We don't spend a lot of time by ourselves with ourselves. Like if, you're, if you have any moment of time where you're like, you got to wait, what do you do? What do we do? Pull out that thing, right? Better check my texts, my messages, my snap, whatever. I'm thinking of getting Snapchat, why not? <laughs> Just to bug my kids. Oh, he's on it? Well, I'm done with it. <laughs> I'm kind of joking about it, but I I'm, keep reading more and more articles about how damaging this addiction is. It is real. And, I, and I'm, I don't only see this in younger people, we're all. Like I'm, I've been amazed over the last year, I was pretty good, up until the last year, I'm just like I find myself doing it. I'm like, oh man, oh, person's five minutes late, pull out the phone, wait, what am I doing? I don't have my phone on me today, and a lot of Sundays, I don't bring my phone. And one pastor I read, their family, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to terrify my children right now, but one pastor that I'm thinking of implementing it is they have a Sabbath, no phones, for 24 hours. Should we try it? <laughs> Why? Because, oh, my friends, my work, my, we're all thinking it, not just young people, right? We're, oh, I can't be without my phone. Do you hear yourself? You're that important. Oh, if, you're not, if people can't get a hold of you, the world could stop. I mean, serious catastrophe could happen because you were not available for 20 hours, right? Man, I, there's something nefarious here, you know? I really do think that. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to address it in my own life. Like, the, this is an addiction that they're comparing it to heroin and crack. I mean, they really are. This is, this is it's, it's kind of lighthearted, but it's also very sobering. We are being reprogrammed. We are being, we are being changed. And not in a good way. I, th I think at some point, you know, the body of Christ, the church, the people who want to follow the way of Jesus, at some point, show the way. Let me give you an example. I met Will Braun for coffee. Will Braun is the editor of Canadian Mennonite. I write for the Canadian Mennonite. We're getting together to discuss many things. He was driving from, I forget where, Thunder Bay or something. It was very far. So I, I sent him an email. I said, here's my cell number in case something comes up and we need to reschedule or delay it. He emailed me back saying, oh, I don't have a cell phone. That's not going to work. Not even a flip phone. Like he, no cell phone. I'm like, wait a second. And, he, and he's still alive. Like he, he manages to survive and exist. I mean, he's been doing this for a while. 
he has relationships with people. He, he, he's very productive at work. I mean, he's the editor of a... Like, huh. We could live without cell phones. Anyways, this is not completely what Jesus is talking about. But Jesus is talking about setting apart time every day. And I think the Sabbath, I, I don't know, maybe we should all try it. I'll bring it up again in the fall. I'll give you, I'm planting a seed. And if no one's here in the fall, I'll know, you went too far. You went too far, Troy. I think ignoring it isn't the answer, though. Yeah, I'm probably looking at it too much. But oh well. Okay, I'll just start with me. I'll start addressing it. And then if I, if I experience positive things in my life, I'll share that with you and maybe I'll share a challenge in the fall. But Jesus, he's saying we need, we have to, this is a spiritual discipline that we need in our lives is getting disconnected from it all. In solitude, in silence, no screens, no news, no checking your stocks or your texts or your messages, no music or podcasts in your earbuds, not just being fully present with yourself and with God in the moment. You cannot grow spiritually without that. You cannot discover and access and manifest your authentic self without that discipline. And I think it's more important now than it's ever been. Here, here's another way of putting it. You can't get to know someone if you don't spend quality time with them. Right? You can't get to know your creator if you don't spend quality time with your creator. But you can't get to know your authentic self either without spending quality time with yourself. Now I realize I have a bit of bias because I really like my company. I really enjoy myself. I think I'm hilarious. I think I'm witty and clever and very insightful. Oh, I blow, I blow myself away with my wisdom some days. That's why I went to a, you know, a cabin in the middle of the woods for a month and it, also, it didn't bother me. I got to stay there for two more months. But I deeply missed my family so I came back. That's what happens. No, we, Tammy and I, we've talked about this. I, 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 there's a chance I was born to be a monk. There's a chance that, that I, I re, I'm, just, I'm really into solitude and nature. So I realize that I'm, I'm a little biased here. But I believe that's not just the way I was born. I believe that is also a result of me trying to follow the way of Jesus. The Spirit of Christ has, has fanned the flame of that in my life and increased that in my life. Because I don't think we can grow spiritually without it. Okay, this is definitely a two-parter. That question has been answered. Maybe what I'll do is I'll skip past page two and three. And we'll get up page, I'm going to skip past page four as well. Maybe it's a three-parter now that I'm looking at this here. And I want to come back to Pentecost Sunday. Because here's, here's the reality. Oh man, now I want to say so much. Let me just read the scripture. That's usually a good thing to do when all of a sudden I have too many words and thoughts in my head. Acts chapter 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit, to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, the gift of God, which he said, you have heard from me, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And the disciples went back to Jerusalem to the upper room. They were in one accord devoting themselves to prayer, to being present with God, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. If we want to be open to the Spirit, if we want more of the presence of the Spirit in our lives, if we want the baptism, the full immersion of our consciousness in the divine Spirit, we need to wait, create space in our lives. And if we're waiting like this, oh, man, 
Jesus said this, ah, it's been like five days. I thought it was going to be two days max. All right, let's check. What has uh, Martha been up to? I often hear people say, where's God? Where's God? Are you creating space? Are you waiting? God will, God will not, the Spirit will not impose divine presence upon you. Here's another paradox, and then I'll, and then I'll stop. You have to be empty in order to be filled. You have to be empty. You have to create that empty space. And it's, and it's not, Jesus doesn't give a list of demands if you, you know, if you, if you tithe enough and if you don't do any sinful things for seven days in a row. And if you, you know, it doesn't give us a list of requirements that, okay, then you'll receive the baptism. Just wait. Just wait. Prayerfully. With presence. I mean, this is a theme in the Bible, Right? Isaiah 40, 31, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Who wants-